my name is João Krav, and I will uh, talk a little about the configuration and cloud and deployment magic on my data. Uh, my name is João Krav, like I said, uh, I'm a software engineer like most of you, but on the last five, uh, five years I was, uh, I, I was working on uh, the ops side of IT enterprise, the dark side, the terminal black side, that kind of stuff. And uh, hope that today you, you learned something uh, about operations and whatever this title gives to you. Uh, to start, I will explain some concepts because I, I'm sure that half of you don't understand them all. And then I will explain the, the actual magic that we, it happens on Mindera, at least on uh, some clients and some process that use that, uh, that process. Who here knows what is continuous delivery? Raise your hand. Okay. Who? No, no, keep, keep, keep. A, a little of a team. Uh, who uses continuous delivery? Keep the, the harm. Okay, good. Uh, continuous delivery is the process that, uh, uh, like the name sounds, uh, achieves the delivery continuously of new features and bug fix to production. So it's based on a pipeline, not exactly this one, like this one. You can change if you want, but it's very similar. You start to compiling your code, running unique tests, and then deploying it for some environment, a QA environment, a staging environment, running tests against that environment, and then deploying to production. One very important thing is that if some, something on this project breaks, it should give you uh, immediately feedback. SMS, email, Slack, Skype, whatever you want. Simple, a, simple, a simple radiator that usually uh, appear on these TVs. Uh, and that is very important because if you get feedback, you can fix it faster. And what is the biggest advantage of uh, CD versus another methodologies like waterfall that I guess half of us learn on the uh, college. It's that when we deploy something, we know that when, if you want to the, uh, do uh, rollback, it's not a problem because it's a small chance. Imagine waterfall. We do a lot of stuff and then we deploy. And there is a bug. So we have two choices. Or we keep that version while it's not fixed and the bug makes us to lose money. Or we roll back the features and we lose money either way. With continuous delivery, we do constantly deliver new features, and that makes us comfortable because the process is repetitive, and if we do this every time, what is the problem? Let's go deploy another build on a Sunday. No one cares, it's, it's a normal busy day. That are the biggest difference between these two processes. Continuous delivery have a big or a small brother it's called continuous integration. Who knows what is continuous integration? Who uses continuous integration? Who thinks it uses continuous integration? It's a big difference between using and think that it uses. Continuous integration is not a tool. I'm showing here Jenkins, but continuous integration don't require a tool. It's a process. A process that says that you should, you must integrate your code every day at least. Integrate your code, it not, it's not the same thing of pushing it for a remote branch that you have for your own. It's integrating your code with the other code of the other people. So you should push the code to the master branch or whatever the branch that you think that it's the central branch of your product. It makes sense? Because, because if you don't do that, your code is not integrated. Then, like a nice to have, you have the integration server that can be Jenkins, one of the most known continuous integration server, that checks the chance of that repository, pull the code, run tests, compile the code, and then generate some kind of package or artifact. Okay? But this is the nice to have. The thing on continuous integration is push the code deal with the merge sooner than later. 
Who knows what is configuration management tools? Okay, I got today. So, what is configuration management tools? Anyone knows Chef? Okay, how you know what is Chef and you don't know what is configuration management tool? What is Puppet? Ansible? Okay, so imagine your laptop. Imagine that I remove right now your laptop and put all the laptops here, and I give you a new laptop and say to you, please replicate all the software and every chance that you have on your old laptop, on your new laptop. Who can do that right now? Two people. Okay, I can't. I can't because there are a lot of files that I change every day, like the tasks file that I write. I have to do something that I don't do backups like that. You do backups on that? Ah, you can. Yeah, garbage is part of the process. Oh, okay, okay. It's part of the process. And that is important because which have Puppet and Ansible, they don't make you, it's not a silver bullet for that, but at least they give you a process to replicate what you have now to be replicated later. Think like your grandmother's receipts. She gives to you and you just need to reply. The, the receipt. If you try to, let's put a little of sugar. Well, it can go, go wrong, right? So if you keep the receipt, you get a good product. And it's what these tools try to give us. It's a process of keeping, repeating the tasks on different computers that you define and in a human readable way. And you can easily share that receipt in different computers to get the same output. And you said, why don't do that in bus? Or why don't do it by yourself? Because the difference is that when you have your laptop, it's easy. You lost your laptop, you repeat, you uh, install everything in your laptop in one full day, right? Imagine the first day that you get to work. You have to install everything. You, lo you lost your first day of work installing things. Imagine in production when we lose one machine. Imagine Amazon in the Christmas day, if they was out their machines, they was our, they, they're busy, right? So we need some kind of way that we can replicate the computers in a fast and reliable way. Make sense? If not, comply, please. If you don't understand my English, I can uh, talk with you in Portuguese then, or in another language, it will be funny. <laughs> What is a mutable server? Anyone? Okay, people on my ears. Well, a mutable server, on the other way, uh, well, let's explain what is a mutable server. A mutable server is what you have in your laptop. It's something that is constantly changing because the Windows said, I need updates. The JDK say, I need updates. You do updates by yourself because you change files, you change everything. So a mutable server is something that is constantly changing. It's something that people do manual change. It's a mutable server, like the sound said. And then configuration management tools. They help you to keep the mutable change hypo, uh, that you can um, get a manifest, a receipt of the mutable change and, re and replicate them. But then they don't avoid you to connect to the machine with the SH SSH or with a remote control desktop and do whatever you want. But at least they can get you in a state that you had before because you said, I want this state. And then there is the immutable server. That is something that you don't care. If it goes to the hell, you don't care because you can replicate it again. You can make a clone of that image that you did before and create a very like machine on the same way. It is reproducible, it's tryable, and we hope that there are no human access because there is no need of that. You can connect to that if you have permissions, but there are no need. And immutable servers on our pipeline, like I saw, uh, showed you, show you before, it's like we create a image, a immutable server, we put it running, 
whatever you want, a VM or a container. And since it are getting traffic from our clients to the end of its lifespan, it don't change. OK, of course it changes because it's getting requests and changing logs. Garbage, like <laughs> the Zemersins are saying. But the important thing that is the logic and the configuration didn't change. If you want to make one change, you create another immutable server and you put it on production. OK? So what is containers, Docker, and Kubernetes? What is containers? Who knows? What is Docker? Who knows? What is Kubernetes? Who knows? OK. So, so much fun. What is container? Container, it's like this, a VM, a traditional VM, not just a VM, it's like a virtual box or a VMware or whatever the hypervisor you use. It's like this one. I'm not expert on containers, so I will not give you a big definition like, I know what is a container right now. No, you at least learned something about containers. That the big difference, uh, no, first the similarities. Uh, the first thing is a container is like a VM in kind of, it's a binary. It's a binary that you pick and you uh, move the, that binary, copy, transfer, deploy, like a VM. When you install it and you want it to run, you need something that understands it. Like a VM needs a hypervisor, a container needs some kind of container engine. The difference between a container and VM, a VM to run, at least the VMs for VMware and VirtualBox, needs a full system operating system running. This means kernel, this means a lot of libraries, a lot of things that you don't need. For example, I bet that you have a full Ubuntu, Ubuntu in production right now that you don't need that. Because Ubuntu brings to you uh, like uh, um, graphic drivers and you don't need graphic drivers on production because no one go to the Ubuntu server and click on the GNOME or Kappa DA, right? So why you have that kind of libs on production? You don't need that. And container is one of the big advantages is making things small and just what you need. And even with this fantastic technology, there are people that like to have the bins and libs of the size of a guest OS. So they use containers with a big Ubuntu instead of just what they need to run, whatever. What is Docker? Like, you know what is a Tupperware, right? A Tupperware is like a, a container a recipient. And no one says container recipient. Everyone says Tupperware. So Docker is the same. No one says container. Everyone knows containers like Docker. And Docker is just an open source community and a big enterprise that just bring to the common of mortals the uh, faster and easy way of work with containers. It's uh, open source. It has very different tools to work with containers, but it's not a container. It's a way of working with containers. There are another ways, like using Rocket, that is a a concurrent company or Linux containers or others. And then we have Kubernetes. That is another tool that we use on, on my data. Uh, I will not explain why we use. We like to use them. There are uh, good points, bad points. Docker have also a concurrent to Kubernetes that is Docker Swarm. Uh, but the point is we need in production a container orchestrator. What is a container orchestrator? When we install in our machine a VM, like for example, I'm running a Mac OS uh, Sys, and I want uh, Windows, I install it on uh, my VMware, and it's easy. But if I need to install 10 VMwares of Windows in production, it's not so fast, it's not so easy. If someone goes down, I have to bring it up. So how I do that? Well, for containers, there is things like containers orchestrators, like Kubernetes, that manage all the life cycle of the container, the self-healing, the service discovery, etc. It's that kind of point. I will not get in details because it's another big talk. It's a lot of documentation for me to <laughs> give you now to you. So what is the point magic in MindDira? We have a lot of ways of doing continuous delivery on MindDira. And, uh, 
we have two big ways that we use in uh, the most of our clients. One is using AWS with AC2, and the other is Kubernetes in the Google Cloud Platform. Who knows what is AWS? Okay, for the ones that don't know, it's Amazon Web Service. Uh, our pipeline in uh, AWS is very simple like this one. We build, we create an ME, that is an Amazon machine image, we then deploy to QA, and then we deploy to production. CI, it's very similar uh, with the one that I saw, showed you, uh, show you before. It's like this one, but we had this, because this is specific for us. We like CentOS distribution of Linux. Uh, I will not explain why, but it's just because we like. So then, instead of uploading a jar for a Maven repository, we, we like to build the RPM and deploy to a YAM repository. It's just uh, old stuff, legacy stuff, that because we do that that way. You can do whatever you want. You can get a, a package of node package management and put it on the NPM repository if you want. Don't have to be a RPM, okay? No problem. Then we, the magic comes here. This process is based on Netflix. Netflix uses and still uses a lot of this process. They have his package, they pick up a base ME. A base ME, it's like a uh, Ubuntu, whole box. And then we put Chef installing software inside it. What, which software? For example, if I have to install a jar, I have to install JDK first, then I install the jar. <coughs> and then if, for example, I need uh, some uh, product for collect metrics or logs, I need to install some uh, log uh, stasher, for example, from, from the LK stack, or another thing. So uh, logs and metrics collectors. Oops. What happened? Okay. So then after the running instance have everything installed, for example here, what happens? We ask AWS to create a, a image from it. It's like do a snapshot of it, don't change any, uh, uh, any if, don't change after it. And then it's created a product ME. And then we destroy the image that help us to create ME. After this point, we don't need RPM uh, anymore. We use the product ME as our artifact for our production pipeline. And then, uh, this is uh, like uh, more details about AWS. AWS have a feature that is auto scaling. It's like you said, AWS, please install this machine in 10 machines, uh, this image in 10 machines. And if I get traffic, for example, in Christmas, uh, put it to 20, because I will get a lot of work, a lot of traffic. But after Christmas, shrink again to 10, because I don't want to put you, uh, pay you a lot of money. OK, makes sense? It's something that auto scales automatically based on alerts that you define for shrink or, uh, for shrink or grow uh, your cluster of machines. So we, we put our product, AMI, on our auto scaling group and then register to our load balancer. Who don't know what is a load balancer? OK, so our load balancer now have a lot of machines with uh, machines registered to it. So when the traffic gets on that load balancer, it distributes to the machines. Then we have a cluster of QA with our new build. How we change the traffic for the internet hits it. We just has to root 53, that is a network as a service, and we ask, please change the name, qa.mindera.com, from the old load balancer, from the older build, to the new one, and then the traffic goes to the new load balancer. How we do in production? Oops, the same way. We don't change the process. The process is exactly the same in QA and production, or whatever the steps between QA and production. And this is very important, because if we change the process, it's another point of failure, OK? So it's very important in continuous delivery to keep the same process from the point that you install in some computer that is not your own until production. There is an example on Jenkins using a plugin 
uh, of our, one of our pipelines. For example, these files give us automatic feedback. And for rollback, it's very easy too, because we just need to kick the older build. What it will do is creating a cluster of the older build and asking the AWS to tweak the DNS again, like this. So we have this build that have bugs, the 205, and then we want to do rollback. We click on 200, like clicking here, and then it creates the new cluster of 200, and then turns the ka.mindera.com or mindera.com from the old one, from the old new one to the old old one that is the right one. But then uh, the people complain as always, and the programmers don't want compiler times very slow, and uh, we are spending a lot of time in spinning apps our pipelines. And containers hype came across, and why don't use Docker, and why blah, 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 blah. And let's go using Docker. Let's go in using Docker on cloud with Kubernetes in Google Cloud Platform. So our pipeline for containers, it's very similar with the other one. On these two points, we still deploy in QA. Instead of AWS, we install in Kubernetes, and instead in production, same thing. The build, it's a bit different. We, on the build stage, we compile the code, run any tests, and then push the Docker image to our uh, Docker private repository. It's not for the Docker Hub, of course, because it's conf uh, code that our client don't want to be exposed to the internet. So it's a private repository. <laughs> Go continuous with it. It's another tool for continuous integration and continuous. It's just a task tool. Uh, so it's very similar, but instead of creating RPMs or whatever you want, we just create Docker images so we can now use containers instead of virtual machines. And how we deploy them on the containers and the Kubernetes. Uh, sorry, let me check just. I'm on time. Okay. Uh, Kubernetes have a very easy um, API that we configure the things on JSON or YAML and push it for using its API. So when I say that I want to deploy a Redis application and I want two VMs, in this case two containers running Redis with the last version of Redis, it's just this that I need to push to Kubernetes. And it will create two containers of this image uh, we can have a, a lot of metadata, a lot of configuration, but the basic configuration is this one. And we have two headers running on Kubernetes. But then, how the traffic go to the containers? Well, we need to define this ki kind of configuration that is a service that it will find every a container that have on metadata label app headers, like this one. See, metadata name headers. We'll find every meta, uh, container running that says, I'm a Redis, and we'll resist it to itself like uh, I'm a service that I'm looking for container service on target port 6379 and exposing the, server, uh, the service on the same port. And on this point, you can connect to Kubernetes and ask for the service, Redis uh, 2.6379 and you have the Redis working. And how this works graphically, because code is <laughs> a bit of pain, it's, uh, forget this part, imagine that we have Redis here, two containers, a pod is a, a specific thing of Kubernetes, Don't, uh, let's not go there. Uh, RC is a deployment, it's a replication controller, so we put here the, imagine RC like the code that we show I, I show you uh, in the first place. And then it creates two replicas of Redis. And then the service is looking for replicas of service. When I want to do a new deploy, I apply a new configuration file, a YAML file, and then Kubernetes by itself, because it's a, a tool that do that, will create another container for Redis. And if it's okay, delete this one. Creates another one. And if it's okay, do it this one, and then we have 
two new containers of the new image, not the old one, running on the Kubernetes. Okay? If I, I guess this is a lot of things for a, a lot of you. If you have doubts, please ask me later on Coffee Break in Portuguese if you want to. No problem. Well, it's just since the slide, didn't I? Yeah, QA production. It's exactly the same thing. Again, it's very important that our process from QA to production is exactly the same thing. The only thing that changes is the cluster from QA in production. Rollback. Rollback is just saying to the Kubernetes, please, I want the old version again. So it will install the old version. It will create again the old containers. It will destroy the new containers that are not good anymore. And then the service starts to serving the, the traffic to the old good containers. OK? The advantage of our process. I have no time to talk about these advantages. There are not much because the containers, it's a great tool. It's a great way of doing things. I, I guess the biggest disadvantage of Docker and containers is because it's a cutting edge technology. So like of documentation, no one knows the things. The forums don't have always the right answer. So we have to find, we have to, uh, like we said in Portuguese, but uh, pedra to get the, the right solutions working. So, but the advantage is, the first one is security and no connection to machines because no hammer time. I mean, no one can connect to production and do whatever he wants. And let's fix just this. No, we don't like that. And that will get security teams of our enterprise with a happy smile, because if no one connects to production, they are happy. Well, the second thing is metrics and logs, central visit metrics and logs. For example, in Mindira, we have a product called Statful, and we uh, collect all the metrics of our application to Statful. This is not uh, a thing that containers need, really need, but it's a nice, nice, to, uh, nice to, to have. Because if a container is something that can be destroyed like that, if you don't have connection to the container, how you know the logs and how you know the, the metrics? You can't connect to do a top or a PS. You can't connect to, do a, uh, to see the logs. So you, you have to collect them put in a centralized place, and then query on that too. The other thing is auto-scaling, because it is very good, cool. If you are on call, you don't get bothered, because the machines grow if need to grow, and shrink if need to shrink, and you uh, don't lose your money on that process. More advances, like I said, fast rollback, you just need to provision once, and this is very important, principally, uh, mainly because who, who works here with Node? Okay? Uh, if you install in QA a version of Node, and then two days after you install the same version of Node and package, it will not be the same version. Because the Node package management is so broken that, and people don't know how to use that, that when you use uh, package X and depends of the package Ypsilon, two days after, it depends of different packets. So you have two different versions of your product running in production and QA, and you didn't test that new version in production. The other good thing is automatic recovery. Well, it's that. Embrace the ops world. Uh, it's, oops, it's not. It's a big uh, world, a lot, uh, full of new concepts. Uh, if you don't work with it closely, go to your season main, uh, embrace him, give his hugs because it's a big, big task to working with this, and uh, enjoy uh, Docker in your laptop because you will get a lot of nice things, and try to put in your enterprise these kind of concepts because it's like Netflix, Google, AWS, Facebook, etc. are using. And if you want to be the best, you have to going with how the best use. And if they are using that, it's because of some reason. And then, is that some question offline? You can get me on, on, uh, in the internet with the, this name, John G.B. Cravo, and is that. Questions? <laughs> ah, okay.
have a, a question. I have a question. Uh, okay, uh, I will not give you the answer. Why not Winstalk? Yeah. Why not Winstalk or any kind of uh, platform as a service instead of infrastructure as a service? Who knows what is Iroku? <laughs> not uh, Irau Heroku or Okay, Heroku it's a, a platform as a service. It's something that you just push it the, the jar or the node or the zip that you want, and it does every work that you want, uh, raising machines, installing the machines, and uh, putting traffic to that machines. We don't use that kind of stuff because we have some clients that need specific features and specific constraints like real-time uh, transactions like betting and uh, we need to have uh, in our hands the power of change everything that we want and in our machines if we need for example to change the kernel if we need we have to change it and we need the power to change and that kind of platform as a service makes so many magic for for us that it's it's too much magic for our clients. And for that reason, we still use the platform as a service. Not sure if I answered my question, but I can. It's that. Any question more? OK, guys. Sorry if anything. <laughs>